Uh, so good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here this afternoon. Uh, my name is Betty Meek. Um, I'm from the University of Ottawa, and I'm uh, co-chairing this session with Olaf uh, Mosbach Schultz from the European Food Safety Agency. Um, I think we're going to get started because we've got a full program, and um, it's, it's a pleasure for me to introduce our first speaker. So it's uh, John Paul Gosling from the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom. Um, and he is the Director of Research and Innovation for the School of Mathematics at the University of Leeds. Um, he, his main, his principal area of focus is quantification of uncertainty and assessing risks uh, using competing sources of information. Um, and he's going to talk to us today about uncertainty quantification in next generation risk assessment. I think he, I've, I've had the pleasure of participating in a number of workshops with uh, John Paul, and I think he's well qualified to uh, provide that overview. Thank you, Betty, for that very generous, over-generous introduction. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Uncertainty quantification is something that I could speak about for a very long time. So it might go on for a no, Betty say no. It's not going to go on for a while. Uh, so just to set something out straight away, when I'm talking about uncertainty quantification here, I'm talking about uncertainty quantification for risk assessment particularly. I try to keep separate risk management and risk assessment. Of course, risk management is important to try to frame what we're doing, but we're talking about what components can we assess uh, and attribute uncertainty to actually feed into a risk management process. But I'm trying to keep these two things quite separate, as you will see as we go through. So here's my overview. I was asked to give a kind of run through of quantitative methods. Uh, I've not got enough time to give you a full assessment, although I do like this very, very recent cartoon by Randall Munro on XKCD. Gives you an idea of what kind of uncertainty we can do when we put uncertainty, 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 uncertainty. I would argue that we maybe don't need to do that, and maybe there's some kind of middle ground where we can actually use uncertainty without worrying about extra layers upon layers. So in particular, I'm a subjectivist statistician, so I'm going to talk a little bit about subjectivity and probability, but not a lot. Then I'm going to move on to my main topic, a bit area that I've been researching now for almost uh, 15 years, which is uh, risk assessment, and in particular, then what we call next generation risk assessment, where we're moving away from the animal models and seeing how we can bring in computational models, uh, in vitro experiments and the like, uh, into our risk assessments. So let me continue. So. Uh, Professor Teagan already said a bit about this already, and this is a, a, a result from a, uh, a quite a poor study, so it's a very, very limited sample size, but it gives you an idea of how expressing uncertainty through phases can add extra ambiguity. So this is one of the reasons why I'm so keen to put numbers on uncertainties, because they have actual meaning. Of course, we need to explain to people what that meaning actually is, but once there is ways of operationalizing it, and then there can be really no argument about what these things mean, as they're going to. But if we look through here, you've got an entire range from uh, almost certainly to chances are slight, which is, a, I'm not sure on the ordering of these in particular, but you can see there's a very great uh, amount of d discord in how people assign prob probabilities to each one of these. So, for instance, so this is probably based on about 20 people and just saying, well, what do you think this probability is? So it's a very quite crude study. But if we look at things about even, where you think, well, if somebody says about even, surely they mean 50-50. And even here, there's, there's still a disagreement about what that might mean. So I'm a mathematician. I am interested in numbers. But I'm interested in numbers for talking about uncertainty because of the precision that it can give me. So I'm going to tell you that probability is on a zero to one scale. Zero means that I'm absolutely certain that this event will happen, and one means I'm absolutely certain it will happen. But then I can say to you, well, my probability is 0 0.4. And that might mean different things to different people. If I try to translate that into words, that's going to be very difficult, as we've already heard from earlier talks and earlier comments. But we can actually operationalize what it means 
these different numbers by thinking about what people's preferences are over different bets. So essentially, if we ask people to think about what fair odds would be if we had a certain bet uh, of whether something was going to happen or not, well, what would be a fair amount for one party to put in versus a fair amount from the other party? So if it was a 50-50, say, a toss of a coin, then surely we'd think a fair bet would be, well, somebody puts in a, a one unit and the other person puts in one unit, right? And that would be fair. If it's, uh, say, somebody thinks, well, somebody should put in a, a one unit into this pot, but somebody, the other person, should put in three units into the pot because they're much more likely to win. Well, in that case, we would think that there's a 75% chance of winning. So there's a translation between odds which can actually be operationalized and, uh, and it's got the same meaning across everyone. That does not mean that everyone has the same probabilities, of course. I'm a subjectivist, so I believe that everyone has their own beliefs and everyone's free to express their probabilities. So the probability is going to give us different levels of uncertainty. Like, say, if I'm at zero or one, I'm very certain. If I'm right in the middle, 50, at 50%, then I'm very uncertain about whether that event's going to happen or not. So this is probability of event, which is fairly straightforward. We can try to imagine how we might calculate probabilities there. But what about when we get to an unknown quantity, maybe a continuous quantity that could take infinitely many values? Then there's a bit of a transition there, because we've got to think about, well, what's the probability that quantity is less than zero? What's the probability that quantity is greater than 10? Essentially, what's the probability that this quantity is less than any value? So there's infinitely many choices, uh, sorry, infinitely many probabilities that we need to specify to actually fully capture our, our probability distribution. Now, there are mathematically convenient forms to capture this, which is good, but we should always realize that this is just a model, so we're never going to be able to ask somebody for infinitely many probabilities, so we can't do all different grades. So we need to make a mathematical model to jump up to that next stage. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do that uh, in a few slides, but there's going to be a next talk, I think you'll go into greater detail than I have, on making that transition. So just so we're all on the same page of the kind of things I'm talking about here, when I've got a continuous quantity, like I've got a quantity here which I believe is somewhere between 100 and 200, this uh, is a probability uh, not, it's not a probability distribution, it's a probability density function uh, showing what I think is most likely is around 135. You can see the peak of that density, but I think I'm quite uncertain about this. So I think a, a, a PDF here is a very good way of expressing my uncertainty. I think it's somewhere between 100 and 200. I think it's most likely to be around 130, 135 perhaps. But I'm not going to rule out values between 110 and, and 170. They're, they're all... Uh, within what I believe might happen. So that's one way that we express, and we've seen some probability density functions already today, and we've also seen some cumulative distribution functions. So essentially what this is saying is, well, what probability do I assign to the quantity of interest being less than the value on the x-axis? So as I move along that axis, there's more and more chance, I think, of it being less than, right? So it's a cumulative process. So right down at the left-hand side, I believe there's zero chance. And then as I transition all the way up towards 180, by that stage, I think it's certain that uh, the quantity of interest is going to be less than that particular value. So these are the tools. These are the basic building blocks I'm going to use trying to express my uncertainty. So there's a leap. One way that I try to capture uncertainties is through something called expert knowledge elicitation. Uh, there are very many different protocols for doing this, and one particular one that I do is, is called the Sheffield Method, or SHELF uh, protocol. And essentially what we do is we have a group discussion about evidence. We do inv individual judgments, which are, we do questioning, which tries to reduce the types of biases that we've already heard about, the heuristic, uh, the problems with the heuristics. Then we try to, uh, we discuss the different individuals' opinions, and try to come up with a distribution which is a good, fair representation of what the experts in the room think. And I'm going to go a little bit more into detail in a, in a second. But the key point is that we have a set of documents that cover this entire process. So you'll see a lot of what I do is I'm not going to say that my model is correct. I'm a, I'm a subjectivist. 
My model might be correct for me, it might not be correct for everyone else, but I'm going to be very, very uh, transparent about my assumptions. So when I'm doing it in terms of mathematics, I can write down the equations and I can tell you exactly what I've done at every step. If I'm going to use expert opinion and I'm going to take this in, I'm going to actually be transparent and lay out the steps that I've taken to form that expert opinion. So we've already asked, seen people ask about the priors in a Bayesian model. So when I see a prior, it's a very natural question. Where did that prior come from? What evidence was that based upon? And part of our processes when we do an expert elicitation is to capture all that information. So this is, this is the uh, kind of run through of the way that I would conduct uh, expert knowledge elicitation. So we'd have a, a stage uh, right here where the group is going to discuss the evidence presented to them. Really, it's not a game. We're not trying to prove that an expert is cleverer than another expert. What we will do is provide all the evidence to all the experts, and then the differences of opinion become through differences in how they interpret the evidence. So it's not as if we're going to say, well, there's this expert here who knows this, and this expert who knows this, and let's see where they're coming in the middle. Let's just tell them everything, and let's see what the opinions are based on the full scientific evidence available. The kind of things that we do, we will get a kind of plausible range of uh, uh, where they think the, the parameter would be, so that gives you a kind of ballpark idea. We will ask them for the median and the quartiles. We certainly will not ask them directly, oh, what is a median, what are the quartiles? That'd be ridiculous. That's very challenging to do, even with some, somebody with statistical training. What we do is we've got ways of questioning people where we can actually get these things out indirectly. Uh, then there's a jump. So you'll see that we've basically asked them two things here. Well, what, what's the kind of lower limit on what you believe? What's the upper limit? Give me the median, which is some kind of central estimate, and give me some idea of the uncertainty around that by giving me these two quartiles, the 25th and 75th percentile. I said a minute ago, for continuous quantities, we need to make infinitely many judgments. So now there's going to be a leap to get to that probability density, and as a statistician and a modeler, I'm going to be the person who makes that leap. So what we do is we fit individual distributions here, so this is just a, the five experts in the room, then we'll discuss the reasoning behind why there are differences between these experts. Is it, say, you gave more credence to a certain part of evidence? Why did they think that way? What kind of rationale are they giving? Then we'll ask them to give different types of judgments, and that's to try and stop a kind of anchoring effect. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into the technicalities. But then again, once we've got these extra judgments, I'm then going to fit a distribution for the group. So this is supposed to be a distribution which encapsulates the group, the range of opinions in the group. It's not about averaging the experts to get tighter agreement. It's about trying to capture every opinion that's in that room. But again, I've made an assumption about the distribution. So I'm a mathematician, I'm making assumptions. Because I want the group to have ownership of the distribution, I will get them to discuss that last fit and see whether or not they agree that that's a good fit for their particular beliefs. And this we could go round and round and round until we've got something that a group is happy, is reflective of what they say. So it's not as if uh, I'm just applying mathematics to the end of it and just giving a distribution. We're actually having a feedback stage where they can actually say, well, actually, that accords, or actually, that, that looks totally wrong, given what I know, right? So there's that chance to feedback. Also, what I probably wouldn't do, there'd be the, typically for a new set of experts I'm working with, I wouldn't just be showing them PDFs and saying, do you think that PDF is correct? Because again, that's ridiculous. That's asking far too much. We would give summaries of that PDF in, in language perhaps more that they can understand, but still in the language of probability. So moving more on to the uh, next generation risk assessment, I talk a little, very, very briefly about quantitative decision making. Essentially, I'm going to be talking about situations where we've got uh, hazard and we're uncertain about that hazard, and we've got exposure, as we've seen already. We're uncertain about that exposure. We saw it in the Proba Plus tool. Uh, and we want to know, essentially, if an individual has got some uncertain exposure and we've got an individual's uncertain hazard uh, dose, then kind of what's the probability of these two things crossing? So this is the kind of information I can give. I, I'm, I hesitate to give a threshold, or we're saying uh, in the probable plus tool, you don't really want to give that hard boundary because that gives p 
people as if you're giving them the answer, right? So you want to give them the information. So I want to give them the uncertain information, maybe in a, a form like, the, like it's a probability, and say, well, you can now make the risk management decision based on the best available evidence that we've got. So that's the kind of background of the types of things that I'm trying to do. We're trying to quantify these uncertainties so it's going to be fed into risk management. So going on to the uh, NGRA, the Next Generation Risk Assessment, we're trying to transition away from having this situation that we've got up here on the left where risk managers have kind of fixated on some animal model. I've worked a lot in skin sensitization, so in there we've got the uh, murine local lymph node assay, which is used a lot. And essentially what their methods boil down to is taking a dangerous exposure, or their EC3, however that's derived, and then dividing it by some uh, 10 to the power X, where X depends on what kind of uncertainty factors they want to do. One of the issues I have with this is because as soon as you start talking about uh, what's going to be safe in humans, then you are moving a little bit over into risk management. So what I would prefer to do is try to focus, instead of focusing on the mouse and trying to move from that, why not focus right at the start on humans and thinking about how the data relate to humans. So a recent publication by Dentatal, uh, I think it came out last year, talks about NGRA and some of the principles in NGRA. And one of the key things is, is this bit in the middle, a tiered iterative approach. The full gold standard, kind of maybe some Bayesian analysis, maybe some kind of imprecise probability analysis, is very costly and very difficult to implement, typically, uh, if you're going to do it properly, in my, in my experience. So we do need to be realistic about the different uh, levels that we need to do. So if it's very, very clear right from the start that the exposure is nowhere near the, the asset, there's going to be no point in us doing the gold standard uh, quantification of uncertainty, right? So we should always keep this in back of our mind. Another thing, of course, that I've gone on is it's got to be human relevant, uh, exposure led, it says, hypothesis driven well, fine, designed to prevent harm, well, I should hope so, uh, otherwise, I'm not sure what we're doing at all. Uh, so, when I'm doing this, there's going to be plenty of uncertainties coming in as I'm trying to transition into using the in vitro and in silico methods. And of course, we've heard about some of these uncertainties already. So there's kind of traditional uncertainties that we've got through experimental variability and, and, and measurement errors. And then you've got the kind of big, big uncertainties, really, which are maybe more uh, epistemic uncertainties, where we, we really don't know how the in vitro system or the in silico system really accords with the human situation. And that's where there's a, there's a lot that we can do, I think. So here's my one slide on, on all the methods for capturing a city. And these are not all the methods by any stretch of the imagination. This is my favorite methods that I want to tell you about. So when we've got uh, experimental uh, data and we think about variability, in measurements, well, traditional statistical methods can be used there. There's no problems with that. So the kind of frequentist, hypothesis testing, confidence intervals, all these things are very useful in this situation. Then we've got, we've already heard about this a little bit, Bayesian statistical methods where we can model uncertainty, that's the epistemic uncertainty on top, and we've got methods for combining data, then there's expert knowledge elicitation, network modeling, because with this it can be challenging to model dependencies. It's a kind of mechanism to help us to, to model dependencies. We've got the probabilistic modeling, Monte Carlo type methods as well, which are very much linked to uncertainty uh, quantification. And also there's qualitative approaches as well, which some people have been starting to use, I think especially in EFSA, where you can start to get a qualitative appreciation through uncertainty tables. Then you can transition, you can decide where the greater uncertainties are, what are the most important uncertainties are in order to, to move your, uh, your analysis on. So in terms of weight of evidence, I'm just going to give a, a very, very quick example of something that we did quite a few years ago now, where we look at, uh, we're interested in true human potency of a particular chemical. We've got very many different uh, tests. So this is, a, we've got historic uh, uh, mouse tests, historic guinea pig tests, We've got uh, new reactivity tests in vitro experiments. 
And we use network representation to try and understand the links between different things. So we've got this idea that we've got experimental results here. And they're links to what's happening in reality in these different animals. And then these different animals are linked to each other. So essentially, for, for the statisticians, what I'm trying to do is build up a conditional independence structure. But for people who are not statisticians, I'm trying to give you a visualization of how everything can be linked towards that thing that we're really interested in, or in, I'm mostly interested in in my research, which is actually uh, human toxicity. So just to talk a little bit about a mechanism for for actually weighing all this evidence, we've heard about Bayesian statistics already. So I might have some uh, measure of human toxicity. It might, it might be a dose of concern or something like this, but I'm going to be uncertain about it. So I use pi to represent a probability density. So I have prior beliefs about human toxicity. But really, I know I've got all these different sources of data that I want to bring to bear on it. So I'm interested in, well, what's my beliefs on human toxicity given these data sources. And Bayesian statistics is essentially a very, very simple formula which can be very, very difficult to implement. So it gives me a formula of basically multiplying my beliefs about the uh, human toxicity, which is the prior beliefs, with my beliefs about how the data are related to human toxicity as well. So people get fixated on the prior, but we ought to remember as well that the, uh, the data model is also my subjective belief typically as well. So again, it's very important because they are beliefs that we're transparent in how we've come to these uh, different functions. What's very good about Bayesian statistics when we've got multiple lines of evidence is that it's just the case of multiplying everything together. As long as I can specify a model, how does that data link to the thing that I'm actually interested in, I can do the mathematics. So I'm going to do a very quick example, just trying to show you one dimension what Bayesian statistics is doing. So we've got a quantity of interest here where my prior belief is that it's around 10. I don't think it's going to be less than 6. I don't think it's going to be greater than 14. But there's some... Uh, wiggle room in there. On the axis, y-axis are not plotted, we've got probability density. Here, I've got some data, and this is quite weak data. The data here is a likelihood function, and it's saying that the value of 10 is the most likely, but it's so weak that I can't really rule out other values, so that's why it's so flat. So when I combine these two uh, functions together, it hardly changes my beliefs at all. So you can see, I'm not sure, it's just gone, the little purple lines has gone on there. So it gives me, a, the data did tell me 10, but I know the data's pretty weak. So it's not changed my beliefs very much. So it's a very coherent way of updating my beliefs in light of data. Then I can collect another data point, which is slightly in conflict with what I said, not much in conflict. It's saying there's something around 11 in the data, but it's ruling out very low values. So my posterior there then becomes something which is a kind of compromise in between. You see my uncertainty is reducing because uh, the data are actually according with my models. And I go on and get another one and another posterior. So you can see how you can update and the kind of strength of the evidence, which is in the peakedness of those dotted or dashed lines. So the more peaked that is, the more uh, strength that evidence has in actually changing my beliefs. Just to get towards wrapping up now, so in terms of, that was in terms of uh, bringing in different data sources. In terms of mathematical models or the alternatives, I do worry a lot about this kind of black box problem where people feel that they're far too complicated. So we do need to try to increase transparency as far as we can. But that doesn't mean that we dumb down the science. So there's a problem on communication, of course, at, for take-up, but we shouldn't dumb down the uh, level of scientific... Uh, um, expertise that has gone into in it, de developing these models. And I think actually understanding the limitations and, and accounting for the uncertainty properly can, can really help in people understanding what a model does. So I'm got, just going to go through a bit on the PBK model. Essentially, throughout the PBK model, there's tons of parameters that need to be specified. The example that I was going to show here is essentially you just press a button and you turn one thing off, and it really changes how the, uh, the chemical moves around the bottle. 
body. So here I, I had a chemical flowing into the brain in this particular, and I just increased something that was happening in the blood-brain barrier, and all of a sudden I've got nothing going into the brain. What a shocker. But if we're uncertain about how the chemical reacts to that particular barrier, then we need to be able to keep the uncertainty around these different things as well in mind. I won't go into this example. I just want to finish off a little bit by saying about model verification. Uh, so if we're doing models, we should be very careful to try and check that they're doing the actual things that we want to do. And this is quite different from model validation about checking whether or not something is actually adequate for our purposes. And there's many things we do, like sensitivity analysis, etc. And all this is to do with, uh, it's made better if we have a great appreciation of uncertainty. So I've got some conclusions there, which I won't read through. I'll leave them, and they're going to be on the slides. Essentially, the main thing is saying, if we discuss uncertainty, we are actually uh, transparent about our assumptions, it's going to improve the scientific rigor. I, I'm, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. I'm going to finish <laughs> with my references. And <laughs> thank you. Spot on. Spot on. <laughs> We have some time for questions, uh, so there's one here, please. And please use the microphones, it was very difficult to, to hear this morning. Two comments. First, I'm glad to see you uh, doing a licitation of the experts separately before you start putting them together, as I will show tomorrow. When we've done elicitations on climate scientists, we find they, get, they produce distributions that are much broader than what comes out of the consensus studies for things like IPCC. The second comment is that different experts may have different uh, underlying judgments about the physical model at work. And in that case, you probably don't want to combine them. You want to say, if this model of the world is right, here's the consequence. If that model of the world is right, that's the consequence. John Evans at the Harvard School of Public Health has done some lovely work in this space where he actually lays out these alternative models and then asks experts to make judgments about which one is likely to be actually correct. Yeah, just, just on that, yeah, I think you're absolutely correct. And actually through the discussions and looking back at the individual ones, we can actually identify where there are these different schools of thought. But in that particular case, we would report the two, two separate or ex-separate ones. Because yeah, trying to artificially force them together is, is not right. Yeah, I mean, if you put them together, you may get a situation where there's some probability at places that neither one no, yeah, really no, thinks is very likely. Yeah. Okay, there's another question over here. Yeah, thank you for this talk. It's a, the title is about the next generation of risk assessment. And I'm just thinking, are you presenting anything that is really new? Oh, thank or, you. <laughs> or, or, is, or is it the fact that, that we are not not doing what we should do in a good way as we do now. And that's what you mean by the next generation, that we should do things well. I think you're putting words in my mouth there, Ulrika. <laughs> uh, I absolutely believe that there's been so much excellent science done in the in vitro space and in the silico space. So I think that bit's been done. I think there's, be, there's obviously been years and years of research into the statistical side of things and uncertainty quantification. So again, I'm, I'm not saying anything new on, on either of those things. So it is more about how we can get both communities work together and, and kind of bridging some of the communication issues. We have time for one more question. Is there any? I, I had a quick, oh, sorry, please, yeah. No, no, please. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. And I have two questions. Maybe the first one is a little bit naive. So if I want a group of experts to determine a distribution, so how many experts I need to have? That's my first question. And the second one, you talk about the combined different source of uh, the information using the Bayesian theories. And this morning, we have learned about the Dr. Schaffer theory to do the same roles. So what's the difference between them? Thank okay. you. <laughs> well, your first question is, is a, is a very, very nice question. Your second question is a very, very challenging question for me to be very nice about. <laughs> so the first question, how many, how many experts, what experts? So clearly, whatever we do is going to be conditional on the experts that are in the room. Uh, typically, when I've done things like this, there's not been enough experts to actually get into the room. So if we talk about something like climate change, 
Uh, of course, as many people have got opinions, as many people want to get into the room, but on very particular parts of toxicology, it's, it's, there's not so many people who have real expertise in particular areas on particular chemicals. Now, getting to a certain number, the, for the kind of processes that I do with managing group dynamics, it's usually around six to eight people, not so many uh, more, because it gets difficult then to, to stop people dictating and people be, just becoming quiet. So I should say that the, on dempster schafer theory that I do n categorically do not believe that that's a coherent way of doing uncertainty. So that's, my, uh, that's what I think is different. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sean Paul, and I think we've got to close off the questioning now. Okay, thanks.